started a new book, uh, oh yeah, we started a new book last, last week on Jeremiah, but if you don't have one, please raise up your hand. We have some over here that we can get, get to you, all the way in the back there. All right, man. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> He's going to do the sixth graders and stuff, you know. All right, that's a man after my own heart. Filling in the gap. All right. <clears throat> um, Jeremiah, and while, while the new books are being passed out to those who don't have it, uh, and I'm sure some of this was mentioned last week, but Jeremiah is known as what the what prophet? The weeping prophet. And why is that? What's that? I heard a bunch of stuff at the same time, but yeah, it was a bad time. And he was telling them they're going to be destroyed, and he had to talk about their sins and all that. But like some preachers today, he didn't get pleasure in that, and so it really broke his heart as he was telling them these things. And so he is known as a weeping prophet. And uh, also, uh, what other prophets overlapped uh, Jeremiah, the major prophets anyway, overlapped him? Do you remember? And uh, Ezekiel and Daniel. And uh, this is during the period of the exilic time. You know, we can uh, arrange the prophets pre-exilic, exilic, and post-exilic in relation to the exile. And, uh, of course, Jeremiah was a little before, a little during and all that. But he was preaching and prophesying in and around Jerusalem, telling God's people what was going on and why it had to happen. Ezekiel was uh, in the land of captivity by the river Kibar, and he was telling the captives over there what was going on and why it had to happen. And then Daniel, he's in and around the courts of Babylon, and he's telling, you know, he is representing God to the uh, civil rulers and such uh, in the courts of Babylon. And so everywhere God's people were, everywhere that mattered, God had a prophet. And so in Jeremiah, in this particular lesson here, um, let me see, last week, uh, what was the exact title of that last week, but it was about Jeremiah and his mission and all that, the call of the prophet. Uh, and this week, uh, notice uh, the readings come from chapter 2, Jeremiah chapter 2, and really this could be subtitled, uh, Pictures of Apostasy. Uh, almost every th single verse in here deals with their apostasy. They're turning away. They're going back. Uh, well, you'll see the significance of that here in just a moment. Let me get my zapper and all that stuff ready. Uh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if you guys can see that or not. I need to make that bigger probably, don't I, next time. Okay. Because uh, what happened, as I say, when I went to that new <clears throat> PowerPoint, you see how the dimensions are different. It's long and skiddy now, not square to fit. Uh, and so even though it's the same size font as the last time because it shrinked it down to fit that screen, but that's the problem with technology. You know, it keeps getting, a, you know, you always got to buy more stuff to keep up with it, you know. But they, anyway, mm -hmm. what's that? Yeah, I've asked a few and they don't. Now, I can, if I take up an old slide, like, like this thing will read the old program. So if I take up an old slide, it'll be that same dimension. But then... Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we had to put it down and up. But anyway, uh, but anyway, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll just read from the text here. Next time I'll make it bigger, I'll make a note of that and make that bigger. All right. But anyway, but I was going to use that for my cheat sheet. So let me turn my Bible over here. In uh, Jeremiah, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and uh, Jeremiah chapter 2. And, of course, this is in the New King James translation, as the book is. But... Uh, you know, he's got this, well, the three sections here, the defilement of the land uh, in chapter 2 and verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7, uh, I brought you into a bountiful country to eat its fruit and its goodness, and, uh, but when you had entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priest did not say, where is the Lord? And those uh, who handle the law did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things they or that do not profit. Walked after things that do not profit. And um, <clears throat> so here's an indictment that he's giving them. And um, well, let's see. Well, we'll start out with. Um, my heritage here. Now he talks about the land, and as that point is, the land, defilement of the land. Uh, but notice my heritage. My heritage, a heritage is like uh, something that he passes down. 
like the word heir and heritage kind of go together. You know, we are heirs of God as Christians. We're heirs of God and co-heirs, uh, joint heirs with Christ. Uh, and so, you know, did Israel deserve the land? No. Did Israel earn the land? No. Uh, God gave it to them. He made them a special people simply because of his love. And if you hold your finger here and go back to Deuteronomy chapter 7, Deuteronomy chapter 7, and um, <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 7, uh, the Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you are the least of all peoples, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep his oath, which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought, uh, brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage and from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Uh, and so they were given special status, not because they deserved it, not because they were such a great nation, but because God loved them. Now, Deuteronomy is written right before they go into the promised land, but uh, under Joshua's leadership, they will go into the promised land, and, uh, but he is reminding them of these things. And then even when you get to Joshua, look at Joshua chapter 1, and of course Joshua has taken over, uh, has you know, taken Moses' place as a leader of God's servant, uh, and he says, um, you know, Moses, my servant, is dead, verse 2, now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, all his people, uh, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel. Notice the land which he is giving them. Not paying them, but giving them. It's by his grace. Uh, it's a gift. It's his heritage. They are heirs of that, if you will. And, uh, but notice they still have to do something to receive that land. Namely, <clears throat> go in, conquer the people, and drive them out. And so a gift is still a gift, even though we have to do something uh, to receive that gift. And of course, back when I was first baptized and all that, the preachers would always uh, give an example of a $5 bill and say, I'm going to give, you know, pick out a person, you know, in the audience say, okay, I'm going to give you this $5 bill. All you have to do is come up and get it. Well, the person sitting in the pew has to do something to come up and get it, but it's still a gift. It's still not deserved. It's still not earned. It's a gift. And that's the way this land was. They still had to do it. And by the way, that's the way salvation is. For we are saved by grace through faith. You know, grace is God's part. Faith is our part. And we have to do something to attain that. <clears throat> All right. And that doesn't make it any less of a gift. All right. Now, as we continue, re well, notice the next uh, thing here. Uh, the priests. All right. Now, notice these, the priests, those who handle the law, <clears throat> uh, the rulers, and the prophets. Now, these all should be the leaders of the nation, right? The, uh, the priests, uh, they represented the people to God. Uh, the prophets represented God to the people. Uh, those who handle the law. Uh, let's see, what does the King James have on that one? Anybody have a King James there? In verse uh, 8. May have the same, I didn't check on that. Uh, Pastors, pastors, okay, shepherds, pastors, shepherds, uh, those that handle the law, okay, um, interesting, uh, and then also rulers, of course, and maybe is shepherds for rulers, or maybe not, go ahead and read the verse in the King James, verse 8, please, somebody, the priest said not, where is the Lord, they that handle the law, do be not, pastors, Okay. All right, very good. All right, <clears throat> and so uh, pastors is for rulers, and uh, they who handle the law still they who handle the law in the King James and the New King James. And that's a good point there with the rulers there, rulers, pastors, and what's another name for a pastor? Yeah, shepherd, yeah, I was going to say, don't say preacher now. Uh, but another name for, at least in the New Testament, same Greek word, shepherd and pastor. And of note, the word pastor only occurs one time in the plural in the whole King James New Testament. And that is in Ephesians 4 and verse 12. You know, he gave some of the church to be apostles, some prophets, uh, some pastors, some evangelists and teachers. Uh, and so the pastor is not a preacher. But in this context here, it's the same, still the same word for shepherd. 
and uh, rulers were known, uh, were referred to as shepherds. <clears throat> now I have this verse saying for the practical applications at the end, but we may not get there due to time. So let's look at this now. Look at Ezekiel chapter 34 to illustrate this, Ezekiel chapter 34 on the rulers uh, or shepherds uh, or priests. And Ezekiel uh, 34 verse 1 and the, Lord, and the word of the Lord came to me, saying... Now, remember, Ezekiel is contemporary, at least in part of his ministry with Jeremiah, dealing with the same problems, dealing with the same issues. Uh, and so he came to me, saying, Son of man. Now, Son of man is not a messianic title in the Old Testament, not till Daniel chapter 7, 13, and 14. But Son of man, just like the old movie... Uh, what was that movie, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe? But that wasn't the name of it, but the movie... What was the movie, you guys? Narnia, there you go, Narnia, you know, the humans were called sons of Adam, or sons of man. And that's what son of man means here in the Old Testament until you get to Daniel. And Daniel was, uh, that part of Daniel was, t takes place uh, right before the 400 silent years, not too far before that. And during that intertestamental period, son of man really became a messianic title. So when the New Testament opens up, son of man is, is a messianic title. But here it's not. He's just simply saying, son of Adam, son of man, prophesy, notice, against the shepherds of Israel. And this word shepherd is the same word ruler there. Against the shepherds of Israel, prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Now notice when he indicts them here, everything that they are doing is the total opposite that a true shepherd should do. They feed themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened, nor have you healed those who are sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and on every high hill, yet my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them. Therefore, then he goes on to pronounce their judgment. Then, and also in the same context, he uh, talks about the true shepherd that's going to come, which of course is the Messiah, Jesus Christ. But here, everything that these shepherds were doing was the opposite of what a true shepherd should do. Rather than feeding the flock, they're feeding themselves. Rather than uh, protecting the flock, they're protecting themselves. They're slaughtering the flock rather than preserving them. They are not strengthening the weak. They're taking advantage of the weak. And uh, they are doing all these things, again, you know, just to fatten their own selves, just to, uh, whatever the word is, take care of their own selves, but are ignoring the... Um, you know, the true flock that, and, and, and not fulfilling uh, the role that God has given them. And, uh, you know, do we see rulers like this today? Amen. Absolutely, man. Especially in some of these countries, you know. You, I mean, it's just still mind-boggling, sort of. These, uh, you know, like in the Middle East, these oil-rich countries, man, they should be way advanced. But they're not. Uh, they're like almost back in the caveman days, except for the people up in power and stuff. But uh, anyway, you know, the common folks still live like they have for centuries. But anyway, that's another story there. But it's the same thing. But when it's God's people here, and so the rulers who should be taking care of the people, they, are trans they have transgressed against God. And then the prophets prophesy by Baal. And Baal, of course, is uh, one of the main gods of uh, Canaanite religion and all that in the land where they were. And uh, Baal is referred to, uh, you know, he's the god of thunder. Uh, and his name also means husband, uh, which is, you know, you know, God's prophets and stuff do a play on that in some context there when God should have been their husband, but they ran after Baal. All right. And so they're not doing what they should be doing. All right. And then he goes on in that context. Therefore, I will yet bring charges against you, says the Lord, and against your children's children, I will bring charges uh, for as, uh, for pass, uh, for, uh, pass beyond, oh yeah, for pass beyond the coast of Cyrus and see, send to Kedar and consider diligently and see if there has been such a thing. 
His, uh, he, uh, he's a nation char, uh, well, let me go back to here, but then the problem is I get off of here. All right, of course, that's more faded than this, so that's my excuse, okay? All right, anyway, uh, he has a nation, uh, has a nation changed gods, which are not gods, but my people have changed their glory. For what, uh, for what does not profit? Be astonished, O heavens, uh, yeah, be astonished, O heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid, be very desolate, says the Lord. This is Jeremiah 2, verse 13 now. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. All right? And so as he continues here, the desolation of the land, uh, notice he says, I have charges against you. And charges against you. And uh, if you go down there, uh, verse 12, he says, Be astonished, O heavens, at this. And uh, this is a motive that's kind of familiar. Well, it was used more than one occasion through Scripture. But uh, it's as if uh, it's a courtroom here, courtroom scene, and the heavens are witnessing this proceeding here. And if you hold your finger here and go over to Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1. We have a similar situation, Isaiah chapter 1, uh, verse 2, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. And so he's calling heavens and earth as witness to the charges that are being leveled against uh, Israel in this case. And uh, Jeremiah, we have the same thing, only this time he only mentions heavens down there in verse 12 as a witness to the charges that are being brought and, you know, when God, you know, when you go before the judgment bar of God, you know, God is always right. Uh, his assessment is always correct. And no matter how people try to, they try to barter, bargain, get out of that. There's no plea bargains there. There's no, you know, tampering with evidence. There's no technicalities. You know, you're off on a loophole or anything like that with God. God's assessment is always right on. And so it's, it's as if it's a courtroom assessment. And here are the charges. All right, now the uh, um, coast of Cyprus and Sendakedar. Uh, of course, Cyprus is that island out there. Uh, I guess we deal with that more in the New Testament, but that was kind of like the, the uh, westernmost boundary. And then this Kedar is a desert area. And so you have, you know, from east to west, search to see if you can find anything like this. And, um, and, of course, what he means, anything like this, uh, has a nation, verse 11, has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods, but my people have changed their glory. You know, even false gods, even nations that trust in false gods, they don't abandon their gods. They might add more gods to what they have. They might... You know, and, and of course, in this day and age, um, uh, I just saw there's still this earring up here that somebody had mentioned earlier. It either belongs to a set or it belongs to a pirate who only has one, but no. <laughs> uh, but anyway, um, but, you know, even pagan nations that serve false gods, which are not really gods, they don't ever abandon their gods. Now, when they're defeated in battle sometimes, and of course back in this day and age, whenever, whenever you, know, you know, someone was defeated in battle, they attributed it to their God being mad at them. And so even if they were defeated in battle, they didn't forsake that God. They tried to appease it. They tried to correct what they considered their error against that God. But those aren't even gods. But yet, God's people have forsaken Him. They have changed their glory for what does not profit. And, and, of course, there's a ma major, major difference between false gods, that though they have eyes, they cannot see, though they have mouths, they cannot speak, though they have feet, they cannot even walk. And uh, Jeremiah later on, and Isaiah also, and in Psalms, some of the Psalms also talk about that. They can't even walk. You have to carry them on a cart. But yet you put trust in those gods. Now, you think about an application of that today. You know, you look at denominational people. Uh, they're, they're loyal to that denomination, even though it's man-made. They don't quit because some hypocrites are in there. They won't get up and walk out because, you know, some of them do, but they're loyal to those things. But yet God's people, 
get on bad and stuff. They don't get their way and storm out and all this kind of stuff. They turn against God. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Amen. That's right. And even these, these pagan gods, he's going he's to compare them to harlots coming up here pretty soon. Um, you know, if, you, if, you, if your religion involves fornication, if your religion involves it's okay to get drunk, if your religion involves it's okay to do all these worldly things back then as well as today, guess what? You're going to like that. And even though it may cause some inconveniences, you're going to stick with it because, hey, I can do these things. In fact, that's why one reason why there's a church on every corner. That's one reason why people can just start their own church. In fact, one of the manuscripts in our last lectureship in the book there, there he documents sources, how to start a church. Uh, and it's very easy, legally and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In other words, yeah. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and ju just like the people here, though, it's like you know, it's it's a horrible thing, you see. But the true and the living God. And, of course, it's even worse, I suppose, for those who, you know, were once enlightened, as a Hebrew writer would say in Hebrews 6, have tasted of the heavenly, Hebrews 6, have tasted of the heavenly gifts and so forth, if they fall away to renew them again into repentance. Or as Peter would say in 2 Peter 2, 20 through 22, you know, it, it were better for them to have never known the way of truth than to turn away uh, once they've known it. And he compares it to a dog returning to the vomit and the um, sow wallowing in her mire. Uh, and so it is with God's people here. And so maybe the comparison is not so much um, denominational people as it is God's people turning away to denominationalism or God's people turning away to paganism, you know, knowing better. And uh, people can do that, and people have done that in the past as well as in the present. But uh, it's a very strange thing. All right, also notice two evils. Uh, they have forsaken me. And they uh, have hewn themselves cisterns, but he does say they're broken cisterns. All right, and of course all this, I guess, uh, kind of goes the, the land imagery, I guess. But they have forsaken me. They have turned away from God. And uh, a cistern, broken cisterns. And of course uh, we probably know what cisterns are. But the main difference here between them and us is their cisterns were hewn in stone. You know, we have the poly tanks, you know, in some countries they'll have, you know, plastic tanks and all that and sometimes metal tanks and all that. But these are actually carved out in the ground for the most, most part. And uh, there were cracks in them and so sometimes they would put plaster on them and so forth to try to keep the water in. And uh, for the young people that don't know what a cistern is, you know, they used to collect water, rain water and so forth and store it in these containers underground usually underground, um, kind of like I do. I got a bucket, you know, in the roof line to collect water and all that so I can water my plants and clean my windshield off in the morning and all that stuff with the dew. But these are big and all that. But notice they have forsake, well, notice they have hewed themselves. Notice that word themselves. Broken cisterns that can hold no waters. But the fountain, they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. All right, w which would you rather have? An artesian well, you know, would you rather have Zephyr, the spring that, that, you know, Zephyr Hill Spring here, or would you rather have an old, you know, dingy, uh, leaky stone full of mildew and mosquito larvae, uh, larvae, or whatever you pronounce that in the plural, water to drink, you know? Well, obviously, we'd like that cr clear, bubbling up spring as opposed to that. And of course, you know, and that, that the cracks, the cistern, you know, may not have a crack in the bottom, it may have a crack up here, so, but you may have a little, you know, pool of stuff here. And later on, Jeremiah's gonna be thrown into a cistern. And, um, you know, he, talk, he describes it, you know, mud and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, when I was a diver, I used to, they used to have put us in some stuff that was pretty nasty, but we all, you know, come clean and all, but, you know, there's some stuff you don't wanna, you don't wanna be compared to. Uh, and a broken cistern is one of those that holds no water. All right? But that's part of what they have done. All right? Any questions or comments on that section? All right? Notice uh, planted as a choice vine. Uh, notice 20 through 23. Now, 
you know, there's lots of imagery right here, and he, and just like with the title of this lesson, can a maid forsake her uh, ornaments and so forth? Uh, there's a lot of imagery going down through here, um, and the choice vine is just one of those. And I guess the author of the book here, kind of maybe he picks that out as kind of representative of them all. But you'll see some imagery here. That's kind of gra well, I say graphic, but anyway, not really. Uh, for of old, I have uh, verse 20. For of old, I have broken your yoke and burst your bonds. And you said, I will not transgress. When on every high hill and under every green tree you lay down playing the harlot. Yet I have planted you a noble vine and set of, uh, and a seed of highest quality. How then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an uh, alien, alien vine? For though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. How can you say I'm not polluted? I have not gone after the bales. See your way in the valley. Know what you have done. You are a swift dromedary breaking loose in her ways. And we'll discuss all that in a moment. But there are several images that he portrays uh, throughout this. Uh, number one, you have broken off your yoke and burst your bonds. And that has, has to do with imagery of a... Uh, a rebellious, not really the word I'm looking for, yeah, I guess a rebellious ox. An ox that will not listen to its master, but just breaks loose and goes. And the yoke there is a yoke that they would connect animals to, to plow a field or to work. And uh, they have broken that yoke and turned away from God's law. And uh, so they wanted to be free from God's covenant uh, which is also pictured in the earlier verses we read when they forsake the Lord, the living fountain. And uh, this was uh, back in Exodus chapter 24 and verse 3. Yeah, if you hold your finger there and look at Exodus 24 and verse 3, they had agreed to this as a people. And uh, this is a very interesting chapter, but I don't want to read the whole thing. But when Moses came and told the people, Exodus 24, 3, when Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the judgments... And all the people answered with one voice and say, it said, All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. All right? And so they agreed to follow God's covenant. Uh, now, I realize this is generations away here when we get to Jeremiah, but they have broken that now. And it's just like when we're baptized into Christ, we agree. We die to the world, which is a reference to repentance. We're crucified with him, buried, and we rise to walk in newness of life. But when we, when we say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, after we repent, and right before we go into that water, we are saying, I'm going to follow you, Lord. You are my Lord. You know, repent. We've talked about this before. It's, you know, 180. That's what, that's what the theme of that Yes Weekend was a couple weekends ago. You know, we're, we're, we're serving sin. We're... Our emotions are toward sin, our mind is toward sin, our will is toward that, but when we repent, we turn away, and we turn our back on that life, and we seek this life of God. Doesn't mean we're perfect, doesn't mean we're not going to stumble, but it does mean we have a whole new perspective, a whole new landscape, if you will. One of the uh, preachers at the Lectureship in Freed Harbor had mentioned that, um, a whole new landscape as opposed to what we had over here. A whole new perspective, a whole new way. And that's what we are when we, we come out of that water. We rise to walk in what? Newness of life. And uh, the old life has passed away. If anyone be in Christ, uh, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And then verse 18 says, and all things are of God. And that's what makes them new. And so uh, we serve, serve God. But they have broken away from that, and uh, they have not followed that. And then he compares them to playing the harlot. And that might be considered kind of graphic, but it's the Word of God here. Uh, notice, went on every high hill and under every green tree. Now, high hills and green trees, that was the language of idolatry. Um, high hills, you know, the higher the hill, the closer you are to the gods in their mind. Green trees, you know, the evergreen trees, and those trees were known, you know, part of fertility religions and, and all that kind of thing. 
But here Judah is pictured as an unrelenting harlot under the leafy trees on top of high hills. Uh, one goes on to say that's found frequently in the Old Testament to describe the fertility rites practiced throughout Israel and Judah. Number of passages, 1 Kings 14, number of passages he lists there uh, about that. But look at the language. On every high hill you lay down playing the harlot. Um, you know, it's just like laying down. Here I am. Come get me. Uh, but it's a harlot. And uh, he'll talk about their skirts having blood all over them. Uh, which is the imagery of harlotry and uh, some of the other prophets. I don't look at the verses here, but talking about, you know, use the imagery of lifting your skirt and so forth. And, uh, you know, and this is God's people. And man, I've mentioned this quite a bit. Well, not quite a bit, but whenever I come across stuff like this quite a bit, uh, you know, it's bad enough when God's people become like the world. But what about when God's people are worse than the world, you know? Can that happen? Is it possible for that to happen? Absolutely, it's possible. And it does happen, unfortunately. Uh, every single one of us can think of somebody or some people that we know who were once faithful, but now may even be on death row or have just messed themselves up after having known the way of truth and lived faithful, but allowed the world to get back in. And if we don't think it can happen to us, here's a prime example. These are people that saw God's miracles. Uh, some of them that, that, you know, God sent prophets right to them. No way to deny. Here's the word of God. But yet they forsook God and here playing the harlot. When, of course, God should have been their, their spouse, their husband, if you will, but now they're playing the harlot. All right. The next one here, you turned, uh, let's see, you, um, Well, let me see that. Right before 22, right before 22. Okay. You have turned, uh, how then have you turned before me into the degenerate plant of an alien vine? Okay, to turn uh, degenerate plant. And again, he made, made them a vine, but they have turned away from that. Um, a degenerate vine. And uh, in Isaiah chapter 5, if you hold your finger there and look at Isaiah chapter 5, uh, he goes on and makes, this is a good best commentary, well, the best precisely stated commentary on this anyway. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 5, uh, now let me sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved regarding his vineyard. Uh, my well-beloved has a vineyard on a very fruitful hill. He dug it up. This is what God did. God dug it up and cleared out its stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in its midst and also made a wine press in it. So he expected it to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. And so this, this, this husbandman, as it were, which is God here in the parable, uh, he gets his land, he clears it out, takes out the rocks, he clears it out, he dug it up, cleaned up the stones, planted it with a choice vine. Building a tower in it has to do with... Uh, um, well, in some of these ancient vineyards, and there's replicas of this in several places. I saw one in uh, Eureka Springs, Arkansas. I forgot what it was called, but it's where the Passion Play really originated. And, of course, they have them all over the place now. But they had a, a uh, they called it the Bible Lands or something like that. And they actually had, you, you actually got a little, tr uh, little tram, like what Disney picks you up from the parking lot in. And he actually goes to all these stops all over the place. And the tram comes by every 15 minutes. You can spend as much time in each area as you want. But they did have a, a, a vineyard there, and you'll have a stone tower like in the middle of it that's not very high, but it's high enough to get up and see. And what that's for is for a person to guard the vineyard, uh, to run, run out. You know, they didn't, you know, back in those days, fences were made to keep animals uh, out, not in. But anyway, uh, it was to, to, so you could watch over it to make sure nobody was coming in, stealing the, 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 the fruit. Make sure animals weren't coming in, that kind of thing. A wine press next to it, and uh, they did have some wine presses at that place, were usually cut out in stone, and they would stamp them with their feet. But the point is, this, this vineyard's, what, vineyard was expected to be so fruitful that you could just go from the vine to the wine. You know, you could just take the grapes, put them in there, press them out, and then you'd have, have the grape juice there. Uh, it was meant to be that, and so he expected it to bring forth good grapes. But in verse 3... Uh, at the end of verse 2, though, it brought forth wild grapes, and now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, 
judge between, please, between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Why then, when I expected it to bring forth grapes, did it bring forth wild grapes? And now please let me tell you what I will do with my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it shall be burned. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor dug, but there shall come in briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain not upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant plant. He looked for justice, and behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry for help. And so he is perfectly just in taking that vineyard out and destroying it, and that's the implication that Jeremiah gives us. Yes, Fred. Yes. Uh -huh. Tell me about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it and it gives you nothing back. <laughs> it just yeah, it just takes away and gives you something back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was part of it, but but here he's just given the general. He's given a general. You know, here's a picture of the vine. You know, idolatry was part of that. In fact, it was the main thing, and the idolatry came from the foreign wives, among other places. And so it, you know, the, this vine is kind of a general, a general picture. Uh, yeah, in other words, they became weeds instead of fruitful vines, and. Uh, Yeah, I got those too. <laughs> it takes over everything, yeah. And it's pretty, but you know, yeah, you got to keep up on that stuff. But yeah, but they, they, they did not turn out like they were supposed to. And notice with the Isaiah passage, it's not God's fault. He did everything for them. It's their fault uh, for that whole thing. Uh, your iniquity is um, marked before me. Oh, yeah. Uh, verse 22, uh, though you wash yourselves with lye, this the New King James, with lye and use much soap. In other words, they cannot cleanse themselves. They cannot cleanse themselves. Uh, Jeremiah compared this to a stain that remains in spite of vigorous scrubbing with mineral alkali, which is soda, and vegetable alkali, which is soap. And he gives some passages on that. But the point is, is no amount of sacrifices brought to the temple could remove the guilt of Judah's sins. And, of course, Isaiah talks about that. Uh, you know, in other words, they, you know, no, no matter what you do to the outside, you can't get rid of sin. No matter how much scrubbing you try to do or how much whatever, you can't get rid of that. Only God can take care of that. You know, uh, Psalm 51, wash me with hyssop, cleanse me, and so forth, uh, it would be said. And so there's no way that, that soap is going to take that off. In fact, even Peter said when he talked about baptism, remember 1 Peter uh, 3.20, it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. And so only God can cleanse the inside, but he can only do it if people will follow his will. All right? And then that, that imagery right there, so your ways in the valley. Oh, yeah. Um, how can you say I'm not polluted? I have not gone after the Baals. Uh, see your way in the valley. Now that valley there, uh, according to some commentators I looked at, is talking about the valley of Hinnon, where they uh, sacrificed their own children uh, in that valley uh, to gods of Baal and Molech and others. And that valley of Hinnon later became, you know, the symbol of hell, Gehenna. You know, Gehenna in the New Testament goes back to the valley of Hinnon, which is where, which was basically their garbage dump that they would burn, but they would also sacrifice their children. And there's reference to that in other places in the Old Testament. And you see how, how he puts this, how can you say I'm not polluted? In other words, people will deny that they're in sin, but again, God knows and he gives them, here's an example of what I'm talking about. You know, you go down into the valley, know you not, or know what you have done, you are a, as a swift dromedary well let me get back up there I didn't highlight that but a dromedary is a female camel and um, let's see uh, a female camel 
And uh, let's see the word here, swift, uh, breaking, yeah, there you go, breaking loose in her ways. You know, some animals, if they break loose of their, whatever, they're tied to the tree or whatever, some animals, if they break loose, they just maybe drift around. Other animals, if they break loose, they're all over the place. And that's how I'm told these, these dromedaries are, these camels, when they break loose, you know, unless, unless they're reined in, they're all over the place. And uh, that's what God's people have done. They have broken loose, and so they're all over the place. And is it possible for God's people to, today to break loose and be all over the place? Absolutely. And, um, of course, once we, once we quit serving God, once we quit trying to serve God, anything goes. Anything goes. You know, if you can justify, you know, hand clapping and worship service, you might as well bring a piano in. You know, if you can justify women preaching, you know, uh, on Wednesday night or whatever, then you might as well bring them in on Sunday morning. Um, and a number of things. You know, if you break loose from God, you, anything goes. And we need to realize that, that God's, God's ways are, are there. And we have to follow them. That, I believe, is the first bell there. All right, this final section here, uh, immorality and injustice, uh, in verse 32. Um, now, in the scripture reading, it goes through verse 35, but in the comments in the book, he goes through verse 37, so I just put them all up there. But can a virgin forget her ornaments, or a maid in some translation, or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten my days without number. Why do you beautify uh, your way to seek love? And therefore, you have also taught the wicked woman your ways. Also on your skirts is found the blood of the lives of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but plainly uh, on all these things. Yet you say, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead my case against you, because you say, I have not sinned. And then we'll get verse 36 and 37 here in a moment. All right. Uh, but notice uh, yet uh, in verse 32, uh, yet my people have forgotten me, and notice that, days without number. Um, now again, well, men, not so much so, though I do remember the blue socks that I have, and I try to wear those every anniversary, which, by the way, I'll be married four years in, uh, this Wednesday. How about that? But a bride rarely forgets what she had on. And I know we're like in our culture we have, you know, what is it? Something old, something new, something or another, something blue. Something what? Borrowed. borrowed. Okay, there you go. See? <laughs> I'm not crazy. Something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. Now, I don't know how much of y'all follow that. I don't know. Um, you know what? Of course, my kids are in here now, some of them. Uh, so I, I think I should have put some pictures of there what Jaji was wearing, my bride. But uh, it's not to embarrass them because <laughs> I don't. Because there's a good, good picture where they're all helping her get ready, and that's pretty cool. But anyway, uh, but a woman hardly forgets that because it's very special. But my people have forgotten me days without number. And days without number shows us it was a habitual thing. It wasn't just a one-time thing. It was a habitual way of life, days without number. Um, then he goes on to, uh, oh, yeah, notice also uh, you have... Um, Therefore, you have also taught the wicked women your ways. In other words, uh, I got a good quote on this somewhere. Mm hmm. Well, maybe I didn't copy and paste it here. Uh, oh, yeah. Even the street walkers could learn a trick or two from Judah. Um, and isn't that sad? It's, fun. it's kind of humorous the way he said that, but it's sad. You know, what does the world learn from our apostasy? You know, um, when we say we're Christians, but we justify, you know, drinking alcohol, we justify, you know, uh, abortion, abortion uh, boogie woogie twerking, uh, shaking stuff all over the place, you know, uh, we're teaching the world some stuff, aren't we? And I'm telling you, it's bad enough when God's people are like the world, but when they become worse than the world, you know, uh, 
you know, teach our friends how to sneak around and, and do stuff that we know we're not supposed to be doing, or our co-workers or whatever, or fellow students or whatever, and then they learn, ha, huh, you know, this is God's people here, ha, 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 you know, look what we can do now. And, uh... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, yeah. And I think that's a very good observation. Oh, yeah, before, before that bell rings, uh, oh, I got to do this. We're going to get back to that here. Um, oh, man, where'd it go? Woo! Um, where he said, it's not because I did a secret search. Uh, 34, yeah. I have, not found, I have not found it by secret search, but plainly all these things. He didn't have to go nitpick him. It's so wide open. And that's very sad when, when members of the church are wide open in sin. You know, if you're going to do it, at least do it where no one sees it or where you can't, you know, but wide open in sin. And even that doesn't justify it if you do it where no one sees it. Uh, but it's terrible. But going back to what Charles said, yeah, because I think there's a conscience issue. They know that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. And so they get worse and worse to try to cover it up. And it's kind of like drugs and alcohol, you know. You know, when people aren't feeling good, they take a little bit of drugs or whatever and maybe drink a little whatever, and then it gets worse and worse, and they got to do more and more to suppress it and to go all out. And uh, there's something to that, but we'll have to pick that up next time we run out of sand. I did have some practical applications, but I'll just uh, whoop through them real quick. And we talked about all these. Uh, heirs of God can be written out of his will. God's assessment is re irrefutable. Uh, and as the leaders go, so goes the organization. All right, but we're out of time here. Appreciate your attention. And appreciate you uh, remembering the time change. <laughs>